continue. Just, he loves the Lord. And um, I don't know, God's been speaking to me lately about simplicity. And just keeping things simple. <laughs> so many times in our Christian life, we complicate things. We try to make things really tough. And jump through all these hoops and do all these things. And really, God just wants us to love Him and love people. Pretty simple. So I want to introduce to you Pete Landrum. He's walked with us through a lot this past year. And he's walked our city through a lot um, with the tornado and just all the cleanup and everything that's happened. He's been instrumental in making sure that our city is still strong. And so I want you to give it up for Pete Landrum as he brings over this one. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad and honored to, to speak. Yeah, we'll have to turn that down probably a little bit. Uh, very honored and glad to speak to you. Thank you. And uh, two, two things I want to say. I am very glad that, one, we're decorating the church after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. That's in the... That, that's in the third book of Peter, or the, actually the first book of Terry in my life. No decorations until after Thanksgiving. Amen. And second, uh, till midnight, you know, when you get old, and I'll admit I'm getting a little older, not as old as some, but, you know, but getting older, and as I'm getting older, midnight is uh, getting very late. Ten o'clock is my time. You know why? Because when you're getting older... No matter what time you go to bed, your body still wakes you up at the same time to get up. So, in that case, 5.30 a.m., if I go to bed at 2, my body's still waking me up at 5.30. So, you, you begin to use some wisdom saying, I'm going to go to bed. So, anyway, so I probably, if I'm up at, the last time, I, speaking of the tornado, when the tornado happened May 27th, uh, that night, and for those who may not connect, I am the city manager of the city of Beaver Creek. Um, and that's something that, you know, when Terry and I first started here back in September of 17, I believe, uh, I hid here. Uh, we came from Miamisburg Assembly of God in Miamisburg, where I served uh, as a board member there for eight years. Was there about 19 years. And uh, so my job brought me to here to Beaver Creek, and so we transitioned here. Uh, but I wanted to sit back, so I, I really sat back for, you know, but as soon as I sat back and we tried to blend in and, like, you know, keep, keep a low profile and all that, oh, come on, some of you have done this, right? Okay, so, but it was like, I don't know if it was the first or second week, Terry, next thing you know, I get a message at my work, him, somehow related to where I worked and I'm like oh no he found me <laughs> I still don't I never have asked him how did you know because you know I don't put my name and title on everything you know no I was hiding trying to hide uh, anyway so it's been uh, my honor and my pleasure to serve the church uh, you know and the tr as a treasurer as well as the deacon um, it's just my honor uh, to do that so I, I love giving to the Lord all right, so today, uh, Pastor wanted me to uh, follow up what, with on our month. Now, here's talking about getting old. You, you get readers. Um, on top of your contacts that you already have. Um, the definition of unbelievable is two-part. So, unbelievable. Uh, not able to be believed. Unlikely to be true. Uh, so great or extreme as to be difficult to believe. Even extraordinary. So a synonym, synonym uh, for unbelievable is what we're going to talk about today is incredible. So in incredible, one definition of incredible is something that lacks credibility. Now think about that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to date myself again. I didn't look it up. Anybody remember that show? That's incredible. Come on, that TV show? How long ago was that? Was that late 70s, early 80s? I remember watching that. That's incredible. Everybody else is going, what? <laughs> <sighs> Youngins. Um, 
that incre that's incredible. And it was like the, you know, a version of the funniest home videos or something like that where they would show incredible feats of people videotaping things. And they would say, that's incredible. Um, but with that, there's some more definitions here of incredible. Uh, of course, we said lacks credibility. Impossible to believe. Impossible to believe. Un unbelievable beyond belief. Beyond belief. That was a good Petra album and song. <laughs> beyond belief. Uh, hard to believe. Scarcely credible. Difficult to believe. Extraordinary part is magnificent, wonderful, marvelous, spectacular, remarkable. Now, I, I, I defined it myself as incredible as something so far-fetched, it can't be true or possible. It can't be true. That, you know, it just, it's impossible. Well, that brings me to our first point here. People should see us and say their life that they're living is incredible. It's extraordinary. Um, almost to the point that is it credible? Because how can they, how can they have joy in such sorrow? in such trouble. How can they still have joy? That's not possible. But that should be a Christian. So, I want to give an example. And number one here, has something really changed in your life, or are you just crazy? Some, somebody's going to ask that. Has something really changed, or are you just crazy? Alright, so let's, let's look at that. Acts chapter 26. This is Paul giving his defense before Agrippa. So, you know, this is one of many speeches that Paul had to give in his defense. I'm going to jump down to verse 4. So he's talking to uh, Agrippa here, and he's making his defense. So, verse 4, so then all Jews, and I'm sorry, I'm in the if you have version, I'm in uh, New American Standard. It's close. Uh, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth. So he's, first of all, showing where he's been. What, what has he been in the past? So he's saying, hey, all the Jews have known from my youth up, from which the beginning was spent among my own nation at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time. If they are willing to testify that I lived as, as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion, and now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made to, uh, made by God to our fathers. Now he's already given them a little dig that you know the Jews know the promises of the Father, and he's saying I'm, you know I'm pointing out the fulfillment of what happened, and now I'm being uh, you know accused of these things. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day, and for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you if God does raise the dead? Why is it? These Jews, the Jews knew uh, Scripture very well, very well. Taught from as, as soon as they can grew, grew, they had to know the fir first five books of the Bible. Does anybody have the f first five books of the Bible memorized by? Yeah. And those are the ones that are really, you know, really difficult too. <laughs> those are not easy reads on some of it. So then, I thought to myself, starting in 9 here, so then I thought to myself that I had to do so many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he's talking about uh, before. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, have received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were uh, being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I was punished, I, and as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged I was, now he begins to tell his story. So, okay, so everybody has a story. Where were you before Christ? Right? So Paul just said, this is where I was. 
I doubt if any of, uh, any of you were going and helping and assisting and putting people to death for their belief. I doubt it. Anybody? Didn't think so. Just check. I can call the police if there was. But, um, but so nobody's done that. Nobody has went and and attacked somebody for their for their belief. But Paul did. So he's saying, okay, I did this. But when I was basically in verse twelve, he's like, basically. But when I was on the road to Damascus, with the authority and commission of the eldest chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining all around me, and those who were with me journeying with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me uh, in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet for this purpose, for this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, that's important, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. All right, so I'm jumping down to verse 24. And this is Agrippa saying, While Paul was saying this in his defense, so this is Festus, said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter the words of a sober truth. Then it goes down 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? This is Paul asking him. And I know that you do. So, you know, here is the tra transformation that occurred. And it was such a great transformation and he tells the story of how the transformation happened. You know, are, are, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, are you, to the point of, are you crazy? Are you losing your mind? Is your higher education sunk too far down or what? But there was a change in Paul for a purpose. Okay? And I always believe that God does pick us at the, let, let me tell you something. Paul had a transformation, an occurrence, right? But I believe at each appointed time, we have that drawn by the Holy Spirit, that he draws us to him. Um, I want to make it very clear, no matter what I say, no matter what pastor says, none of us can save one of you. None of us. Not our words, not anything. It's only by the uh, power of the Holy Spirit convicting our hearts, drawing us to him is when we say yes or no to the spirit so um, I wanted to ask point number two then that brings me to two yes Lord <laughs> the total transformation of a life is incredible it's unbelievable when you see a transformation now, I'm not going to go down and go row by row, and I want to tell you, like Paul did, Paul told of his past, he admitted to basically participating in murder, you know, putting people to death. So, uh, let's start over here. No. Um, start naming our sins before our transformation. Well, Paul was naming his. He's telling you. He's telling you. I think all of us would be ashamed of those things if we named them, start naming them out loud. Amen. But what will it take for you to be transformed? Does it take a road to Damascus for you? Does it take Jesus coming in a vision, blinding you, putting you down to your knees and saying, why do you persecute me? Why are you persecuting my people? Does it take that? 
Some people it does. But when it usually is something like that that happens, it's for a reason. It's either because like as in Paul, he had, God had plans for Paul, right? Big plans for Paul. But let me share a story. Can it happen in today's modern time? Absolutely. Absolutely it can. I'm not getting anything that's looser. Okay, it is what it is. Um, let me get, give you a real modern day story. I said I didn't even move. <laughs> Don't you love technology? No. <laughs> All right, there you go. Must be a little short in there. All right, so I'll give you a modern day, if you want to call it a road to Damascus example. You know, uh, I and this is, let me say this, as in some places in our country where uh, heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend gets you on national television. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> but this isn't heard it from a friend. It was up until this year until I heard it from firsthand. Okay. My grandfather will be 90 years old next month, December 24th. I had a... Uh, Grandma, who was born on Easter, her first name was Easter, <laughs> and my grandpa was born on December 24th. <laughs> my grandma, when, and now this is, my grandma was the rock of the church, uh, rock of the family, and she, she was very strong in her church as well. But the uh, uh, Lord was gracious upon her, and that's a whole other story, but my grandma died on Easter. Born on Easter, died on Easter. Um, and all the whole family looked up and said, you have a sense of humor, Lord. <laughs> uh, but my grandpa, good, solid man, you know. But uh, grandma, he'd make sure grandma took her to church. He, he would take her to church or some, make sure somebody picked her up. As he sat at home and watched the television evangelist, and he'd say, amen, preacher, that's right, you know. And he'd talk to the TV every now and then. But he, didn't, he wouldn't step foot in church. Well, back in, I don't know, what, 92 or so, he was 60, 62 years old, so do some math, I forget, but he, uh, he uh, was getting ready to have a five bypass open heart surgery, five, okay? I don't know how many you can have, but he had five. And uh, so he was at the uh, hospital in Kettering, Kettering Hospital, and grandma, uh, my mom, and my grandma's pastor, all began to talk to Grandpa, saying, and you should, in this kind of thing. So, Mr. Burke, Grandpa's name is Burke, uh, do you believe, you know, and they went through the whole thing, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe he rose again from the dead? Do you believe he died for your sins? <coughs> yes, 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 yes. Mr. Burke, would you like to accept him in your heart? No. Three times, three different pastors. Boy, sounds like Peter. Three different pastors, three different times. No. My mom, who uh, we just, uh, last week on the 13th, was the 10th anniversary of her passing. Um, you know, I tell you, those uh, young ones that you still have your mother and your father, love on them, I'm telling you, you, you take it for granted. That's, again, another unbelievable story incredible story that I could share it sometime but back to grandpa so mom was there when that happened and mom walked out of that room and that's how the second hand that I heard this story originally and she walked out of the room and she said I was in tears and I was so angry at him why wouldn't he I know he believes why won't he bow that knee why won't he and she said Lord whatever it takes save his soul if you have to show him hell whatever it takes she remembers saying that specifically. Grandpa went on to have surgery. It went well. Soon as he came to, the word of the Lord was on his lips, and he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior without delay. Why? Because he saw hell, and he saw heaven. 
and the things that now he's told me all line up with scripture. Grandpa was a farmer and a truck driver, so machines, okay? He saw these hideous machines with these creatures, unbelievable creatures that would run over people and scream and torment and throwing them into a pit and they wouldn't die. Uh, that, that people would run over and scream and torment, but it wasn't killing them. It was just tormenting them. And then the Lord took them and, to, you know, and showed them heaven. I don't know what he saw exactly in heaven, but he saw a couple people there, which one was my uncle who died in 1980. And the purpose of that, and that's another incredible story. All this is linked. But uh, my uncle who died in a tragic car accident in 1980, living behind four young children, had just been asking Grandma about the Lord the last couple weeks of his life and, and about salvation and about a whole bunch of stuff. And Grandpa heard that John died with the crying out to the Lord. He died with, you know, those who cry out to the Lord shall be saved. So, <clears throat> it changed her life for Grandpa. Grandma, uh, when she passed away many years uh, later, she uh, developed Alzheimer's. And horrible, horrible to see her pass away for those many years, though she didn't hardly know anything. But I, you know what I would do? I'd go visit Grandma and Grandpa, and Grandpa loved it because I would sit there and sing her old hymns, and she didn't miss a beat. <laughs> Uh, you know, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You know, she'd go right along with me. You know, from I'll Fly Away or Amazing Grace, whatever it was, we sat there and had a good time. But you know what? Grandma wouldn't trade anything for what happened to Grandpa. Because after that happened, she had her man by her side in church every single Sunday. <laughs> and she was a proud, you know, as proud as, you know, rightfully proud that she had her man that she loved uh, next, sitting next to her, saved, sanctified, and on his way to heaven. So you talk about a road to Damascus. Now, it was just this year, because Grandpa wouldn't talk about any of this for a while. Mom told me, I said, don't even ask him right now, but they're all past now, so I found the opportunity and said, Grandpa, all right. <laughs> and that's when we started talking about it. And that's why I can say I verified now firsthand that uh, those events were true. So, do you have to have a Damascus experience? Or are you going to take it on faith? Psalms 14.4. Let me tell you this. The fool, Psalms 14.4, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Now, there is no God. That leads you to believe there is no God as far as that's the way it's said. Actually, a more correct interpretation of that is not saying there is no God, but has said no to God. Saying no to God. Because in, in essence, that's what you're saying. You're saying no to God. Some think they've done so much that can't be forgiven. There's no sin greater than the shedding of the Son of God's blood. So I don't care what you've done. You know, a lot of people have done some bad things. Look at Saul. Look at, I mean, you can go on and on. Every, every hero in the Bible that we consider her heroes, uh, David was a murderer. You know, I mean, come on. I mean, we can start naming sins of our heroes. They were forgiven. And, um, you know, a lot of people misconstrue the unpardonable sin. When you go to um, Matthew 12, verses 30 and 31, you know, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. All right, so a lot of people just, you know, I've told the uh, uh, Holy Spirit or I've done horrible things. And, and 
But let me say this. If you're worried that you committed an unpardonable sin, you haven't because you're worrying about it. What is the unpardonable sin? It is blasphemy, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which includes ridicule attributing works of the Holy Spirit to the devil. It is refusing to turn to God and accept his forgiveness uh, as you know, in, in internal sin. So it's really saying the fool has said no to God. So an unpardonable sin is when the Holy Spirit draws you and you say no. Well, how is that unpardonable? Because you, if you keep saying no, you've never accepted the salvation, so it's unpardonable. So when you're judged, you have never bowed your knee to God. So a lot of people think, though, that maybe they've committed that. Maybe you don't know what I've done, Pete. Uh, you know, I don't know what you've done, but God does. And as as uh, as a as much as you have done, that just gives credit to the blood of Jesus Christ and his, his uh, salvation. That it's incredible that he can save you uh, from the guttermost to the uttermost, right? All right, so Romans uh, 12.2. Now, remember my uh, point number two is the total transformation of a life is incredible. So Romans 12.2, it tells us. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, how do I do that? Well, number one, by the Spirit. You, Hey, if you're not walking in the Spirit daily, pick up your cross and follow me daily, but also live in the Spirit daily, praying His will all of this, you have to. It, it's like uh, it's like going into battle without your armor, right? Uh, going into a gunfight without a gun. It's like, uh, okay. Uh, you have to take the, the tools, the weapons uh, of uh, spiritual warfare with you every single day. Because the enemy is seeking to devour, right? All right, so how do I do this? Well, Philippians 4, 8, really easy. Really easy. Another Petra song, by the way, I, I will say here. Uh, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there are any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, this version says, dwell on these things. Let us think on these things. Think on the things that are true, honorable, what is right, what is pure. <coughs> You know, don't let your mind wander. Oh, boy. You know, if you begin praying when you get things tossed at your mind, you know, God understands that we have temptations, we have thoughts. You know, that's what the devil's trying to do. But if you begin to pray or said, okay, let me flip to my Bible here real quick, you know, those, those things are going to run from you, okay? Run from God because they are true. They are uh, honor, worthy of honor. All right, brings me to point three. Incredible. Remember, we're on incredible. How far would you go to be credible? When you begin to look at the disciples, you are forced to only have a few options to consider about the belief, their belief in Jesus as one of the true Messiah, the Son of the living God. Okay? You only have two choices. Believe it or not believe it. So, the stories of the disciples was either the truth or it was the biggest sham you've ever seen in your life. Right? There's no in-between there. It was either true or it wasn't. All right, well, let's, uh, let's say it was, uh, you know, a hoax. How far would you be willing to take a hoax, to take a lie? He wasn't raised from the dead. He didn't do the miracles, although there was... Many, 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 many more uh, witnesses of uh, the miracles, you know, how they would have had the setup. Okay, now you're really dead. Now play dead for a while, and then Jesus will touch you and raise the dead. Lazarus, yeah, just stay in that tomb for so many days. I mean, uh, you know, come on. Okay, if it's a hoax, that's what happened, right? Okay, so I know if it's a hoax, what's your motive? Is it money? Is it fame? Is it fortune? Uh, you know, what would it be? When we look at the 12 disciples, well, let's see. 
for a lie, for a hoax, Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, Paul was beheaded. Andrew was crucified. Thomas pierced with four seer, uh, spears by four soldiers. Philip arrested and cruelly, cruelty, cruelly put to death. Matthew, some of the oldest reports, uh, say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew met his death as a martyr. James, the son of Zebedee, was executed by Herod. James, son of uh, Alphys, uh, stoned to death and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealots, uh, so the stories ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias was the apostle chosen to replace Judas. Traditional sends him to Syria with Andrew and to death by burning. Uh, John is the only one of the company generally thought to have died of a natural old age. All right, so you think these 11 guys were a hoax, or did they know for sure that they were with the Son of the living God and that it was for real and that he did come, he did die for our sins, and he was the Messiah that was yeah. promised all those thousands of Hallelujah. years? Which one was it? And they knew they believed. If they didn't believe that, then they didn't believe that, then they were some of the... Uh, most ignorant men in the world that would die for nothing. But today, today is in Jesus' day, people don't believe him nor us Christians. You know, it's, it's a story. Which religion are you going to be? Uh, do you want to be Hindu, Buddhist? Uh, uh, name it. There's a million different ones. It's not uncommon uh, as in Jesus' day. There was They worshipped every... God, Son of God, you know, there, there was many back then, so that wasn't unusual, I will say that. But today, you know, part of our whole testimony in the Gospels is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ that makes it incredible. How can you have a personal relationship with God? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> You see, I know him. He, I walk with him. I talk with him. You know, day in, day out. He tells me. He convicts me. He, he says, well, well done, one of these days. He's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. So, yeah, it's real. Yeah. All right, so Mark 6, chapter 6, verses 5 and 7. 5 through 7. Mark 6, 5 through 7. This is Jesus in his time, okay? Wait a minute, wait a minute. How are they going to believe you? Well, I'm going to show you where Jesus even had trouble because evidently there was a whole bunch of people that didn't, didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, right? He did miracles. He raised the dead. He gave them the sign of Messiah, opened blinded eyes, right? And yet they still crucify him. So do you think... Uh, just because of your testimony, not, not to say we shouldn't, because we should. We've got to. But you're not going to convince everybody. It's not your job to convince. We already laid out. It's the Holy Spirit to draw. Okay? But Mark uh, 6, 5, and 7, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching so he experienced the same thing. So I can tell the story of me personally, of my grandpa. I mean, there, I'm telling you, there's a million incredible stories I can tell and show. Um, and it's still not going to be, there's still going to be unbelief. Um, it, it, it is what we, it's what Jesus dealt with. So I wanted to say, you know, have courage that if Jesus faced the same thing, don't think that just because you're living your life and you're being incredible with the Lord and showing you are being having credibility, they just can't figure you out. That's okay. They haven't figured me out. <laughs> Nobody's ever figured me out. My wife with almost 30 years hasn't figured me out yet. All right, so Jesus told us that those who believe in him would do even greater works. Now, whoa, back the boat up, right? Um... Jesus did all that, then how are we going to do even greater? Well, because Jesus had limited himself to a human body, right? One place, one time, doing the Father's work. But he always said, he told his disciples, I'm sending 
the Holy Spirit. I'm sending a comforter. I'm sending. So John 14, John 14, 12 through 15. I'll get to this here. John 14, 12 through 15. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, okay. Context. (laughs) Thank you. He, remember the garden? Jesus prayed to the Father, if this cup shall pass, and he asked, but not my will, but your will be done, right? Your will. So here, asking anything in my name and I shall do it, it's, you know, as long as it's the will of the Father. But it also says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You keep my commandments, you're going to know me, you're going to know my will, and therefore you're going to uh, do my will. And when you ask for things that are in my will, I'm going to do them. Okay? So it's, uh, you know, we don't have a, uh, we're not going to tempt the Lord and have a box of snakes up here. And so, you know, the other parts where if anything bites you and say, now we're not going to be a snake handling church. Okay? (laughs) <laughs> That's next week when Pastor brings that. Uh, I wasn't willing to get bitten, so I, I, I'm a man of little faith when it comes to that. I hate snakes. Um, <laughs> snakes and spiders, I do not like. Uh, but it's talking about the will of doing the will of the Father. Doing the will uh, and knowing His will. And the only way you're going to know His will is, is to, it's a Hebrew word called yada. Y-A-D-A. And it means to know. And it's, it's, uh, it's used in the scripture about knowing God, knowing him. And how do you know it? You know him, and I, I, this isn't in this uh, sermon, but I just tease you a little bit. To know means to know like a craftsman knows his trade. How he knows metal work. He knows woodworking. He knows his trade very well. He could almost do it blindfolded. Uh, to know, as in Adam and Eve knew each one. So it is as a man and wife would know. Uh, to know, there's so there's like four, five, six different ways to know God. And each one of them is how we are to know God. Each one of those. Uh, it's the intimate side. It's to know as a skilled tra- uh, tradesman. It, it's so many different ways to know. It's more deeper than to know God. Well, I know God. Well, how do you know God? Okay. That was free. <laughs> All right, so Acts 1 8. Everybody should know this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. So you're going to receive power. Power to do what? Everything he did and more. Yes. Everything Jesus did and more. And a big part of that that we'll get to here is the uh, Spirit giving us the boldness to speak and proclaim the name of Jesus. That's the bold part. Now, look, I will say this up front. I don't go around, I can't in my position, it's government and separation of church and state, which isn't in the Constitution anywhere, and don't get me going there, but, but I do not go and say Jesus. Okay? I can't. Uh, I don't have to is the good part because they know. You don't have to. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, yeah, the sun came up. Thank Jesus. You know, Some people go take it to the extreme sometimes. That's fine. But where they try to work in the word, you know, in the name of Jesus in every sentence, every other sentence. I don't have to do that. But if I'm given a door, hey, pastor was there one time. He drops off some bills every now and then and he was there and my uh, administrative assistant, uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, her son had a major, uh, his heart stopped beating, and they gave him no hope, said he was brain dead and all this other stuff. Well, today, he's learning to walk, he's, he's talking, he, you know, he knows, he understands, he, he's got a long recovery, but he's alive. <laughs> and 
so we began to talk and talk about how God and how Jesus and she said, oh, I've prayed, never prayed so much. And, you know, so when there's opportunity, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Not ashamed of it. Just got to be careful. All right, so my last uh, point here. Everybody says, thank the Lord on that. <laughs> All right, last point is, will you be recognized as Ben with Jesus? Will, will, without saying Jesus, will you have been recognized as Ben with Jesus? Now, disciples, yes, it's kind of talking about, well, hey, you know, just like Peter, hey, weren't you one of those that were with, with that guy, with that Jesus of Nazareth? No, no, it wasn't me. But will you be recognized as Ben with Jesus? So Acts chapter 4 here where we're talking uh, Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. They were, uh, why were they arrested? Well, they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You know, those incredible things. Although the Old Testament clear in prophecy clearly showed that there was going to be a Messiah. You know, you read, you read the scriptures. I'm telling you, it proclaimed this, but it just wasn't in their mind of how it should happen. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get, uh, we, we play God because we tell God exactly how we want uh, certain events and occurrences to happen, uh, or a healing to happen, or uh, the job I want, I want it to line up this way and this way, and, you know, not his will. And so then, when God does something, we totally miss it sometimes because it didn't happen the way we thought it ought to happen. Does that make sense? All right. But here, Peter and John were arrested, uh, and they laid hands on them, and they put them in jail. So verse uh, 7. Verse 7. Jump to there. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire. Here you go. Now see if you're ever asked this. By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, here comes that boldness. You know, here comes the same guy who said, no, I don't know him, no, I don't know him, no, I don't know him, right? Boy, you're talking about being transformed. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit uh, done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Amen. Now, he, of course, they're going to say, well, that's incredible, right? <laughs> ah, that's unbelievable. <clears throat> you know what he does? He tells them the scripture. He points back to the Old Testament at this point in time, which they know. They know the scripture. Point back to truth. So he says, uh, He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, in verse 13, Now they observed the confidence of Peter. Ah, they saw the change. And John, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they were amazed, and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Now, yes, they recognize him in the physical form as been with Jesus, but is somebody going to say that about you because of the incredible life that you're living before them? Are they going to say, that person's been with Jesus? There's got to be a difference. Or all of this is, as of the 12 uh, disciples, it's a hoax then. We're wasting our air. We're wasting our breath if we're not believing and living according to what he has said in his word. And I can personally testify that it is true. It is true. I haven't had to have that road to Damascus, but I had, well... I grew up uh, in Pentecost. The, uh, it was an uh, open Bible back years ago, which is the uh, same as a Pentecostal church, same like Assemblies of God. 
And I had those uh, youth group or youth camps that we used to go to. Uh, Terry, you, you went to one, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and they were, you go away for, you know, for a camp, a church camp for a week. And, you know, they were some Holy Ghost nights. There was some Holy Ghost breaking out nights. Well, I would just tell you, you know, when I'm what's called slain in the spirit, or I'm getting carped at time for an hour, and they have to pick me up, set me in the chair, and from the very top of my head to the very toes of my te- uh, feet, toes were just tingling. I had been with the Lord. And that was probably at the age of 12, 13, some, something pretty young. I never forgot those experiences. Never, not that I've been perfect since, and believe me, my wife can tell you all about it after church. <laughs> but those experiences, I've never forgotten. It is important to get to some Holy Spirit experience and the experience with God, and that way it builds your testimony. It builds those that belief that we are serving the one true living God. Are you incredible at your work, or do they think you're? Do they think you're the you are the real deal? Or do they know, not know? Is the jury still out? Well, he talks a good game, but I don't know about it. Talks a good game, and I will say this. Continue to live out your life. They're going to tell you you're incredible or, or you're crazy. Are they going to say you're crazy? Have you lost your mind? Yeah, they may. They may. And don't expect to be perfect at work because... <laughs> If you're going to put on a robe every day and act to be perfect, you're really going to then have more, they're going to have more stuff to throw back at you. But what it is, it's about a relationship. It's about uh, the forgiveness of sin. It's about not being perfect, but I'm saved by grace. I am uh, running for the prize that's set before me, but I, I am such a fa- you know, person, a man of fault. But I know one that has forgiven me. I know one that I strive to be uh, better, to be like, to imitate, to be Christ-like. So make sure it's clear to them in that manner. Because if you put on the robe of righteousness, so to speak, and, you know, I'm, I never sin and I never have fault, you know, they're going to throw eggs at you and probably well-deserved at some point. People find it incredible to believe the gospel message and the personal encounters and testimonies about your relationship with Jesus. But you'll be the first one, you'll be the first one they come to at work when there's trial, when there's something. Will you pray for my yada, 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 you know, my brother, my sister, uh, my this. Uh, My old job when I was, uh, many years ago, I worked for Montgomery County and I was a supervisor there, and again, don't I don't go around saying Jesus, 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 Jesus. I, I can't in that kind of line of work. But people, I, I literally, and I was in awe. I just lived my life, you know. I wasn't ashamed of the gospel, but I just lived my life. And I had somebody come to my door, not not not. Hey Pete, yeah, yeah. I I, I kind of recognize the person. Um, I wouldn't know their name, but I recognize them. You know, see them around work. Do you know that scripture in the Bible that's blah, 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 blah? Okay, there's hundreds of people here. Why are they coming to me asking me a, a you know, scripture? The Bible says be prepared and give answer, though. <laughs> it says be prepared. And it was. But, you know, they know. I didn't, ha- I didn't have to, you know. Now, you may live in, or work in a place that, where you can let it be known. And I would let it be known. Let your light shine. I still let my light shine. I just got to be a little bit more careful. Unfortunately, what they call politically correct, right? But the biggest part is not that you say the word of Jesus. That's not it. Yeah, there is no other uh, name by which you must be saved, shall be saved. So absolutely all that. But what speaks the volumes is what we refer to as the transformed life. The transformed life. The life that they find incredible. How can you go from murdering other Christians to to believing and proclaiming His name? How is that possible? How is that possible? You can go from a drunk or a a prostitute or you, you name the worst of the worst. 
How can you do that and then say, you love God, you love Jesus now? How is that possible? You know, that, that's, the, that's the thing that they should find incredible. But it has to be credible in the aspect that we're consistent in our walk. And, and by all means, when we mess up, we go and say we mess up and confess. Then that becomes, well, yeah, they, they did ask for, you know, sorry what they said, that they lost their temper or they, whatever, they apologize. And, and yeah, well, wow. I'm not so sure I would apologize. I would have told them what I thought. You know? <laughs> right? I mean, that's the way the world is. It's not the way we're supposed to be. So today, I'm asking you, you know, of all this, of, of we've heard Peter, we've seen Paul, we've seen all the examples we read today. Has your life been transformed? Can they say you're, you know, about you and your life that do you have credibility or do you have a lack of credibility? You know, the good news is, there's still time. If, if you haven't been the witness that you should be at work, if you haven't actually been transformed yet, you're sitting here and you say, yeah, well, I just wandered into this church and uh, I've been here a few times, but this, this Jesus thing, I'm still kind of working through some of that. Okay. I'm here to tell you he is the real deal. There is only one name, and that is the name of Jesus, by which all men shall be saved. It is no other name. And I get, oh, I'll just tell you this. I had, you know, those, uh, of course, politically correct uh, prayers. Okay? When they pray in public settings, and they pray, and they'll say, in his holy name, or in his name, or in the name of God, uh, or something of that. And... I know why, and, but I do love when the pastors come and pray, as in at the Veterans Memorial, uh, Pastor Kevin Jack of uh, the Nazarene Church, you know, when he ended his prayer, he said, in Jesus' name, Amen. and pastor did the same thing uh, what, two years ago, a year ago, when he did the same thing, and I'm like, yes, because I've been at like Right Pat, and they'd say this global prayer, and in the prayer, in the prayer, he said, and... I know you go by many names, Mohammed, and, this, and I'm just like, oh, 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 oh. Do you think I said amen? You know what amen means, right? And that I agree. Do you think I said amen to that prayer? No. Kind of disappointed that that's the political correctness to not step on anybody. And our purpose is to go into all the earth, right? preaching the gospel. And it's a simple message. It, it is not one of complexity, uh, but it is incredible for those who don't believe. What? He raised from the dead? Huh? How, how does that work? Well, be prepared to explain it. But today I just wanted to share this message with you that our God, he's, a, he's an awesome God. I mean, he's awesome. He, he gives us so much more than we deserve, really. At the end of the day, I'm blessed. I can't believe God has done the things he's done. If I, if I die tomorrow or something, you know, his grace, you know, his grace is sufficient for me. If I'm the past, if I'm anything that happens, with the trials, tribulations in life, whatever happens, his grace is sufficient. When he died and said, it is finished, that was enough for me. And, uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, when I pass from this life to the next life, you know, those that have passed, uh, gone on to the Lord before us, uh, my mom, my, uh, my grandma, and all that, if somehow they said, hey, do you want to go back? They'd say, no, thank you. <laughs> Here, singing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the President of Almighty God, do I want to go back? <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. And that's the hope that we have, the hope of Jesus Christ. And uh, right now I'd like to go ahead and end, this, end the service here. And uh, I appreciate uh, you guys listening to me ramble. <laughs> but I felt like this was for somebody today.
This is for somebody that says, you know, I do need to step it up. It is incredible. There are things of God. There are things in my life as a living testimony, and I need to make sure it, uh, that I know my testimony. I'm willing to share it. I show it unashamed. And if you are that person today, though, that's saying, you know, this whole salvation thing, I'm not sure I understand it. Well, it's not that hard. It really isn't that hard because just like my uncle that I firmly believe cried out to the Lord asking the Lord, you know, shall be saved. But the difference there is that was the, you know, what, what they say, the, the ones who wait till the 11th hour usually die at 10. <laughs> you know, there's a kind of a joke there, but it's kind of true. You know, you're not promised our next breath. And, you know, it's just one of those things that uh, don't wait. Why wait? My, I still have an uncle I'm praying for, my aunt and uncle. Hope they don't. Well, they watch it, they watch it. But, you know, he's one of those that I have to get my life cleaned up before I come to the Lord. No, 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 no. And us Christians are bad sometimes at pointing our finger at people and why don't they believe, why don't they get this or wear this or clean up and no, let the, let God be God and let God deal with it. And that's sometimes where we, we have that pointing finger and that's what is, has been uh, not too attractive about us Christians. Because, you know, he says, come as you are, you right? Just as you are. And today I just want to, uh, you know, if, if somebody's thinking about, uh, you know, giving their life to the Lord, giving their, you know, that, hey, it, it's not a, doesn't make a bed of roses tomorrow, but it just means you have another friend. Uh, you have a comforter who's going to come alongside you, who's going to give you wisdom, knowledge, boldness. Uh, he's going to speak to you daily, and you're going to, it's not a, uh, it's not a one-way communication. It's a two-way communication. You're speaking uh Two, he, he's going to understand your frustrations. It's okay to pray to God out of frustration sometimes uh, with the right heart. He understands. What do you think he was doing in the garden? You mean I've got to die and be crucified? He knew what was coming. Lord, can, can this cup pass? But at the end, he said, your will, not my will. And today I just want to I'll close in prayer. But I wanted to... Uh, Anybody that might have that uh, that thought in their mind that you know today is the day of salvation, today is the day you can be saved. Very simple prayer. Let's just say it together here. If you're if you're wanting to ask the Lord into your heart and say, Lord, just come in to my life today. Lord, pray pray with me, dear Jesus. I know I'm not perfect, but I don't know you today. But today. I do want to know you. I believe you died on the cross and shed your blood for my sin. And I know today I can be transformed through you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I love you. Come into my heart. Lead me and guide me in your ways. In Jesus' name. Amen. So today, if you prayed that, let Pastor know, let myself know, Deacon member, you know, it says when you accept the Lord, you, you got to confess, go to, go to somebody, let them know. Let us know. Why? So we can come alongside you. And be, you know, if that's the first time, you know, it says the angels in heaven are rejoicing. For every salvation, for every every uh, uh, every spirit that is, uh, every person that is snatched out of hell. You know? Oh, think about that. All right, I'm going to close here. The Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you, you love us more than we deserve. And, and when you came, you had a purpose uh, in each of our lives. You have a purpose, you have a plan, the Word says. You have a plan. And Lord, I pray that you speak to us individually and show us your will for our lives. And may we walk in your will. May we begin to take the steps uh, to your perfect will of our lives. No matter how far we messed up, it's never too late to be following the will 
of the, of the Father. And Lord, I, I just ask, Lord, that you be with us. Lord, I thank you for this church, this loving church that loves people and loves God. And Lord, this is, we have so much to do in this church that you've called this church to do. And may this church continue to walk in your ways and hear from you because we have a whole city, a whole country, a whole state that needs you, Lord. And may we walk in it to be your witnesses throughout the world. And Lord, that your name, the name of Jesus, will be lifted high. Amen. And Lord, we love you. Be, uh, be with us, each one. I bless everyone here. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.